Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Week in Charts. Charlie Bellella here. As always, I'm going to run through some of the most important charts and themes that we're seeing in markets today. Here's a little preview of what we're going to talk about. The Fed's 2% inflation target. I'm going to tell you why I think that's a farce. Japan ended the negative interest rate error with a rate hike this week. One of the best starts to a year in history for the S&P 500. The Reddit IPO will touch on that. Bitcoin is pulling back a little bit after an enormous parabolic run. The Apple monopoly, uh, big story this week. The most unaffordable housing market in history. I'm going to show you why I think that's the case. And an increase in new listings. So some light potentially at the end of the tunnel here for the housing market. So we'll end as we always do with positive news. So let's dig into the Fed and the 2% inflation target. I'll tell you why I think that's a farce, but let's just go back in time here to early 2022 and examine why the Fed shouldn't be trusted in terms of making interest rate decisions. And these are decisions that affect the entire economy. And we shouldn't be entrusting a small group of people to do this because they've shown time and time again that they've gotten it not just a little bit wrong but very very wrong so early 2022 we have home prices up 19 percent over the past year rents up 18 percent producer prices up 9.6 percent cpi up seven percent and pce which is the fed's preferred measure of inflation up 5.7 percent so by all accounts this was evidence of inflation but this is what Jerome Powell is saying. We're not going to raise interest rates preemptively because we fear the possible onset of inflation. We will wait for evidence of actual inflation or other imbalances. And if this is an evidence of other inflation and uh, imbalances, I, I don't know what is, but the Fed did not hike interest rates that month. They waited a few more months before they would start tight tightening policy, which is absolutely insane. They were still buying mortgage bonds at this time despite the housing market skyrocketing higher many a lot of evidence of a bubble and yet they're driving mortgage rates down below three percent so this is just a backdrop in terms of this should not be an institution that you should entrust with making the most important decision for an economy which is setting the cost of money the rate of interest so what did the fed do this week this is what they said they said, we're going to hold interest rates. And that was absolutely no surprise. Before each and every Fed meeting, I put out this tweet, tomorrow's news today, telling you what the Fed's going to do. And no, I don't have a crystal ball. The way I'm able to do that is simply I look at the probabilities that are priced in by the bond market. And what the bond market was saying is 99% probability the Fed was going to do nothing. So Fed, every meeting since 2009 has followed what the market was expecting. And this was no exception. And they announced that they're going to continue reducing the balance sheet as planned. There's increasing pressure from a lot of people saying the Fed, there's going to be a problem if the Fed keeps letting their balance sheet run off. But so far, they continue to do it. They haven't indicated yet if and when they're going to taper, but there's a lot more chatter around that. So this is a look at the balance sheet here. Peaked at almost $9 trillion in April 2022, and now we're a trillion and a half dollars below that so sizable decline but to just to give you an idea of how much stimulus how much quantitative easing went into this period from 2020 to 2022 the fed would have to reduce this balance sheet by another three and a half trillion to get back to where it was before COVID hit so just an incredible increase in terms of the Fed's balance sheet over this period of time and one and a half trillion is a good start but to stop it here seems absolute crazy absolutely crazy if your goal is to kind of normalize this thing and get back to where you were before now here was the big news in terms of the FOMC meeting every quarter they update their projections in terms of the economy in terms of inflation in terms of where they think the Fed funds rate is going to be at the end of the year and over the next few years and this is the incredible thing they're expecting higher economic growth than they did in the december meeting so 1.4 percent was the projection in december now 2.1 percent they're expecting lower unemployment so 4.1 percent in december now four percent today and they're expecting higher inflation so core pc is their preferred measure of inflation they're expecting 2.4 percent now 2.6 percent so an increase in inflation 
lower unemployment, and higher growth. So you put all those things together and you'd probably say, well, the Fed's not going to cut as much as they were pre predicting before. That was not the case. They held their Fed funds rate projection steady at 4.6%, which is implying still three rate cuts this year, despite all of this evidence that inflation is proving to be stickier uh, than they had earlier uh, earlier assumed. So here's what the Fed said. Here's what Powell said. He said his colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power, especially for those who are least able to meet the higher cost of essentials like food, housing, transportation, and we're strongly committed to returning inflation to their 2% objective. Okay, that that sounds great. I would, I would agree with that, that it does imp impose a significant hardship on many people, and it would be great to see the Fed committed to returning inflation to 2%, but we're not back to 2%. Inflation is still above 3%. And what we know here is that the Fed is moving already in terms of the market's expectation, saying that inflation has been solved. So we have the expectations here for the Fed funds rate. The market's saying the Fed's going to cut first in June, then again in September, and then again in November. So three rate cuts this year. But what about that 2% inflation? Well, it's not there yet. We're still at 3.2%. Over the last two years, we've averaged 4.6%. Over the last three years, 5.7%. And even if you go back 10 years, we're still well above 2%. We're at 2.8%. So how does that make sense? How does that square with a 2% inflation target? That's why I call it a complete farce. They have no interest in getting back to 2% because that would require much more restrictive policy than what they desire here they seem to be very biased towards easing they always have been in the last 20 years but it seems clear today they've been talking about this two percent inflation objective we're not even there and even if we were to go back to two percent well that doesn't erase the fact that inflation has been above trend well above trend for this period of time 11 percent above that two percent trend since the beginning of 2020 so what i've argued is you need to have a period of below two percent inflation to get to that 2% average, there seems to be absolutely no desire from the Fed to do that. So 35 consecutive months above 3%, we're likely to see 36 consecutive months when we get that March uh, inflation data. And why is that? Because we're seeing commodity prices, as I discussed last week, start to move higher here. We now have gas prices in the US, 352 a gallon on average. That's the highest since last October. And importantly here, if you can see here, the red line is now above this blue line. So the year-over-year -year comparison now is a headwind for CPI, meaning it's going to start to push CPI higher, whereas it had been below the prior year and helping to push it down. That was a huge factor for most of last year as well as gas prices moderated versus the prior year. So if this starts to become a tailwind here, but for a headwind for CPI, then you're going to likely see a rise in CPI. And that's what the Cleveland Fed is actually projecting. They're saying that the CPI is going to move up now to around 3.4% from 3.2% in February. So despite that, we'll see what the Fed says in reaction when we get that report, if it ends up being that. But despite that, the Fed seems to be saying, no, 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 we're going to get to that 2%. Don't worry. And we need for some reason to start now. And doesn't make sense to me because we have a stock market at all-time high. We have unemployment rate still very low on a historical basis, below 4%. We have home prices at all-time highs. Why wouldn't you keep interest rates higher for longer? It seems to be doing the job in terms of trending lower. Why not finish the job, which Powell has said many times, we're going to stay at this until the job is done. How is the job done if we're looking now at inflation going up to 3.4% and we're not erasing that spike in inflation that we had over the past few years. So we'll see what the Fed ends up doing, but I think it would be a big policy mistake potentially if they're going to think about cutting a few times this year despite inflation remaining well above uh, their target of 2%. 3.4% is not 2%. And even if you got back to 2%, 
that doesn't erase the past few years of above average inflation. Okay, so Bank of Japan, big news this week, ended the negative interest rate error with a rate hike. Not a huge rate hike, but they took it out of negative uh, territory here. They moved it to a range of zero to 0.1%. So still well below uh, the inflation rate there, which is 2.2%. So still stimulative, I would say, and still well below where they should be. But the big news where they were the last holdout. This is the last central bank that remained in negative territory. And now every central bank around the world has a positive interest rate. Once again, there were another a number of other central bank actions last uh, this past week as well. You had Brazil cutting once again. You had Mexico joining the, the rate cut group here. And you can see we had talked about for a while the big spread between Mexico's central bank rate and their inflation rate, which was leading to a high real central bank rate. So a lot of room to cut. It seems likely that they'll cut again. We had Turkey, obviously huge inflation problems, hiking interest rates again, Czech Republic cutting again. Big news out of Switzerland became the first major central bank to cut rates. And so people are saying, well, they're going to be the first to cut and the ECB and the uh, U.S. Fed are going to follow them in terms of rate cuts this year. So that's the expectation. But Japan moving in the opposite direction, ending the negative interest rate error. And here's a picture of what it looked like just a few years ago. May 2020, I put out this snapshot here showing you how many countries around the world had negative interest rate. It was absolute insanity that this actually went on and went on for a few years. Uh, but this was the actual actual peak in the insanity. We had 50-year bonds in Switzerland at a negative rate. So people were locking in a negative return over 50 years in terms of buying these bonds. Absolutely crazy. And all of these countries in Europe had negative interest rates as well. Just insane. 10-year yield in Germany was negative 0.45% per year. And today, obviously, all of these are back in positive territory again which makes sense interest rates there should be a cost of money interest rates should be positive we can debate how what level they should be but clearly shouldn't have this situation and the only reason we got to the situation is because of central banks manipulating uh, the interest rate to this extent on the belief that this was actually good for the economy and they were promoting for all of this time we want to see higher inflation. So be careful what you wish for. They got higher inflation. Japan's getting higher inflation. And we'll see what they do in response to that. But that had been the call for all of this time. Negative interest rates were a good thing. Of course, what central banks never do is admit that they made a mistake. But clearly, in my mind, this was a huge policy mistake. And it shows you that they essentially knew nothing at the time because they what what followed this was the biggest wave of global inflation that we've seen since the 1970s. And what they were preparing for was the opposite. They were all talking about deflation and having to combat that with negative and ultra low interest rates. So just another reminder, it's not just the Fed, all of these central bankers around the world who think that they can set the price of money, they're going to get it wrong time and time again. No human being can set it. It should be set by the free market. So Let's talk about the equity markets. One of the best starts to a year in history. We've got the S&P 500 hitting yet another all-time high uh, this week, 20 now. And that's still on pace, incredibly, to break the record in 1995. So just a stunning number of all-time highs this year so far. 20 on pace to break the record. Uh, that would be incredible if we came anywhere close to that. But another market milestone here, S&P 500 crosses above 5,200. So very quickly advancing very fast. And what we're seeing now, 10% gain for the S&P 500 in the first 56 trading days. That's the 15th best going back to 1928. And if we look at the last 30 years, only a few years were better than this start here. Looking at 2012, just a little bit better. And we have 2019. Remember that year was very strong, persistently strong throughout the entire year. And then you have to go back to 1998, another strong year in the last 30 years. But other than that, this is pretty much one of the best starts we've seen in the past uh, 30 years. And what does that tell you about the rest of the year? 
Well, not as much as you would think. It's certainly not saying the market can't go down for the remainder of the year. Of course, we saw that in these periods here, 1987 being the prime example where it went up, 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 and then it had a, a big crash and actually still finished the year positive. But uh, many of these other years, uh, you still saw gains despite uh, the fact that the market ran up so much. So what should your expectation be? Well, it should always be if this is an abnormal period that it's unlikely to be repeated. So if we were to see 10% in the less than three months, unlikely to see that in the next three months. But in terms of betting that this is going to be a down year because we've had such a strong start, that doesn't seem to be uh, likely based on history. Only two times that we see down years, they were both during the Great Depression after such a strong start. So if we look at the Wall Street forecast coming into the year, once again, this is becoming a current theme. Uh, every single year, it seems like they're getting it dramatically wrong in terms of 2020. The S&P finished much higher than anyone expected. Same thing in 2021. Then in 2022, it was lower than all of these forecasts. And here we are in 2023. Same thing, it was higher. And here we are in 2024 so far. And it's above almost every expectation coming into the year. And remember, these are year-end expectations. And we're not even at the end of March, S&P 500 at 52.41. And the highest target price was 5,400. So it's above all of these other forecasts for the end of the year. So what you see here, and it's a hilarious game uh, that these uh, Wall Street uh, uh, analysts make, is what they do is they start raising their price targets. So you see Citigroup comes out, oh, well, s and is already above our target, so we have to ra raise it. Uh, Bank of America, I heard they raised their target because of this. So it just shows you the absurdity uh, of it. What's even the point of having a target if you're gonna constantly raise it? It's the same thing with price targets on stocks. Absolutely useless, just throw it out. But in terms of sentiment, it was fascinating entering the year, as we said, after such a strong year in 2023, that they were only predicting a 2% gain for the S&P 500 in 2024. That seemed very, very low uh, based on what had just occurred. And lo and behold here, one of the best starts we've seen in history. So sentiment, I touched on this last week, but I want to touch on it again. We're in a different place in terms of sentiment. And this is the reason why, right? We're seeing these enormous gains outsized gains, abnormal gains. And when that tends to happen, you tend to see people rush into the bullish camp. And what a difference between today and where we were in October 2022 in terms of sentiment. Sentiment was in the tank back then. You had the percentage of bulls in this investors intelligence survey at 25%. Today, we're above 60%. Markets over 40% higher today. And what does this mean? This is the uh, basic thing that you should take away. When sentiment is very bearish, so like what we saw in October 2022, there's a pretty strong signal there where you tend to see above average returns going forward. So over the next year, you're talking about 19% on average. That's significantly higher than the average 12-month uh, return in all periods. Now, when sentiment is very bullish, like we're seeing today, you might say, well, is it the exact opposite where uh, you should expect stocks to go down? Not, not exactly. But what we do see is a tendency, you can see here, three months, six month, nine month, 12 month, three year, and five year, a tendency to be below average in terms of those forward returns. So it seems like when sentiment gets extremely bullish, it means that the market is at a valuation level or some type of extreme where it becomes harder to reproduce those gains going forward, but not outright bearish because you can see these numbers are still positive going forward. So these are just averages. Of course, anything can happen in the next year. But your expectation today, just looking at sentiment, should not be as nearly as positive as it was back in October 2022 when we had very few people in the bullish camp. Today, a lot of people in the bullish camp, and, and that's simply because, as we said, all news is good news. Prices are running up very fast. You have a number of story stocks in the market, NVIDIA being the greatest example, and that gets people very, very bullish. So just be mindful of that. Check your emotions. Don't let the FOMO game get you to do something ridiculous, which a lot of people did in 2021 when the last time sentiment was this high. 
uh, just keep your emotions in check and be mindful that you want to be doing the opposite as an investor, uh, as what you see in these sentiment polls. You want to be becoming more bullish when other people are going to become extremely bearish and you want to become a little bit skeptical. You don't have to be bearish, but more prudent and conservative when sentiment is at an extreme like it is today. So speaking of sentiment, you don't have IPOs when sentiment's very bearish. So in October, 2022, really no IPOs to speak of whatsoever. IPOs starting to come back a little bit, Reddit price this week, and the reaction so far, pretty good. A pretty good price at $34 and opened here, looking at above, well above $40. And it's so far staying above that IPO price. It's uh, market cap seven and a half billion which was very interesting because in 2021, during the mania for high growth stocks and technology stocks, it actually had a private market valuation of, of around 10 billion. So significant reduction from that. And we're still seeing uh, that type of thing in the public markets. If you look at the, a lot of the high growth stocks, not the Apple, Amazon, Google's of the world, but the smaller high growth stocks are still well off their 2021 high. So interesting to see Reddit uh, as yet another example of that. Let's break down Reddit in terms of, of where it is compared to other social media companies, much smaller than uh, Facebook and, and these other companies that you probably are familiar with. 73 million daily users, 800 million in revenue. I think Snapchat's around four or 5 billion in, in revenue. And so much smaller animal here. And uh, is Reddit making money? No, it's still uh, not a profitable company. So very difficult to value something like this. So 800 million in revenue. It's got a market cap around 8 billion. So you're looking at 10 times revenue. That's, I would say, above the comps here if we're looking at uh, these other companies in the space. So the expectation must be that we're going to see growth in that revenue. And then we'll see if they can actually turn a profit, then it becomes a different business. So mark, IPO market opening up is just another sign of sentiment that people are feeling better. You don't want to price an IPO uh, when things are going down because you're not going to raise as much money. Uh, they started to uh, file that in 2021, but then they pulled it back because the market really dried up very quickly. So first major social media company since Pinterest to go public. And the expectation is we're going to see more of these IPOs. If the market stays strong as it is today and sentiment remains strong, we're going to see uh, more IPOs in the coming months. And we're certainly nowhere near where we were in terms of 2021 in terms of the IPO and SPAC market. But this is just an example and a good sign that the markets are opening up once again. So I want to talk about Bitcoin pulling back here. And I had mentioned the last few shows Bitcoin had gone parabolic, a number of signs of sentiment hitting extreme. So similar to the equity market, but probably even more so. You had a lot of speculative act activity and not just Bitcoin, but a lot of the periphery coins, Dogecoin skyrocketing again. So a lot of signs of sentiment extreme. And now we're finally seeing a little bit of a pullback. Hit 73,000 last week. We had all of that money rushing into the Bitcoin spot ETS, retail investors getting involved after a big move. That's always a kind of a warning sign. And then you have the fact that now we're seeing a little bit of weakness here. Only an 18% pullback, still up 50% year to date. But just a reminder to investors, and this is the point I was trying to make, Last week, you you cannot have an advance this big without corrections along the way. So Bitcoin is an extremely volatile asset class. It's nothing like your stocks and bonds in your portfolio. It's multiples in terms of volatility. You can see how quickly it can go down 18% just in a number of days. If the stock market did that, that would be an enormous drop, well, well above a, a normal range. But for Bitcoin, this is absolutely normal. We've seen this time and again. You should definitely expect a 30, 40% correction at some point this year. Almost every year you have that. And every few years, it's gone down 70, 80% or more. So just be aware of that. Anything that's gone up this much can go down. No one can tell you, although many will tell you they can, no one can tell you where Bitcoin is going to be in terms of pricing in the future. And a lot of outlandish forecasts come out when you have this type of parabolic advance, don't listen to any of that. 
just be mindful of the risk that you're taking in terms of Bitcoin. Nothing goes in just in one direction. Anything with big upside is going to have corrections along the way. So Apple, is it a monopoly? This has been debated for a long time, but the Justice Department uh, alleged just that this week. They uh, filed a suit against Apple and saying that essentially it's trying to keep its users from switching to other devices, to Android, uh, and uh, Apple has used unlawful exclusionary, exclusionary behavior. And uh, we'll see if they're successful in this, in this suit. There's good arguments to be made in, on both sides. I'm going to dig into this uh, on the next Signal or Noise show uh, in more detail. But in terms of the stock reaction, a little bit of a pullback. Apple was already down on the year 4% uh, decline the day they announced this. So now down around 11% on the year and big diversions from the S&P. You could see S&P ETF up, up over 10% total return this year. So big spread, not like last year where Apple was up 50% outperforming the market. Uh, so much more differentiation this year in terms of tech and in terms of the big players in the market especially Apple and Tesla really lagging the other magnificent seven names. And it's not just Apple. We've seen uh, anti-monopoly lawsuits against Amazon, Google, Meta as well. So there seems to be an increasing push against big tech, against we've seen, and I've noted all of these big profits. And whenever you have these enormous profits, it seems like the government is at some point comes in and says, well, this is too much. And now it seems they seem to be doing that. So I don't want to dig in too much because I'm going to touch on it on the next signal or noise show, but definitely a factor here, if, especially if they're successful in these lawsuits, uh, definitely going to be a factor for these companies. So the most unaffordable housing market in history, I don't think that's uh, overstating anything. I think it's absolutely the case. If we look at the last few years and the change in terms of the U.S. housing market, here's the housing payment that you would have to make on the median priced home for sale in the U.S. In March 2020, it was 1,500. A year later, 1,700. Then it goes to 2,200, 2,500. Still going up. So 2,700 today, and that's 80 percent higher than where it was four years ago. And needless to say, people's incomes are not going up. 80% over the last four years. I think if you look at hourly earnings, it's up around 20% in the last four years, which is great. Above average, if we look at the, the four years prior, for sure, but 20% does not make up for an 80% increase, which makes this what I would say the most unaffordable housing market in history. Another way to look at it is look at new home prices as a ratio to household income and 6.4 times higher than the median household income. We've never seen it that high in history. So in terms of what would make housing more affordable, well, in terms of that payment, the easiest thing, of course, would be for mortgage rates to come down, but they're staying stubbornly high here. We'll see if the Fed ends up cutting a few times this year, if that will bring rates down. But uh, the hope was for them to come down much faster. That doesn't seem to be happening. Still around 6.9% and well above from where we were, obviously, a few years ago. So we had that situation where the Fed was buying mortgage bonds. We hit all-time lows in the mortgage rate, 2.65%. And today, much, much higher. That's causing problems. But the bigger factor, I would say, is the fact that home prices have gone up and have stayed up. So they've gone up over 40% over the past few years. And at the same time, you're looking at a much higher rate of financing that home. So you have that double whammy in terms of the combination of high rates and high prices impacting the housing market. So I wanna end as I always do with something positive. We're gonna stick with the housing market and I wanna discuss the increase in new listings. And this is sorely needed because the activity in the housing market has just been down and it's stayed down. There's actually been 30 consecutive months where we've seen a year over year decline in the sales of existing homes, but hopefully this is going to pick up. We're gonna see more activity and a good sign that we might is that listings are actually going up. So new listings, highest level since September, 2022, up 15% year over year. Why are people listing now? Well, 
according to Redfin, they're starting to get used to higher interest rates and that eventually people simply have to move. So perhaps they've been waiting, waiting, holding off, hoping interest rates go down. They're not going down. They remain elevated. And they're saying, well, I have to move for a job or I have to move. I want to move because I'm retiring and want to move to a different location. Any number of reasons people are starting to move. So hopefully supply goes up and that will help alleviate some of the affordability pressure. So we'll end it right there. Thanks everyone for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button for more content just like it and have an awesome weekend. And I'll see you next time on the week in charts.